This morning, I want to start with an easy question uh, since we're in church. Uh, this, this one, the answer, I hope, is obvious. If I were to ask you, who is the greatest man that ever lived, who would that be? Jesus, that's right. Um, that is correct. Um, I know many of you were going to say Goose Fortenberry. <laughs> but then you remembered, wait a minute, we're, we're in church, this is a sermon. Well, let me ask you this. If I were to ask you the greatest man that ever lived, aside from Jesus, who would it be? Did somebody say goose? Um, that one may be a little harder. I don't, I don't know. You might think sometimes, you know, if you, again, we're in church, you might say Moses or you might say Abraham or something like that. But I think that, that there would be a good defense for the biblical answer being that the greatest man other than Jesus who ever lived would be John the Baptist. And I heard somebody say that. So good answer. Um, Jesus said about John the Baptist, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. That's pretty high praise, isn't it? And I want to tell you something about John the Baptist that might encourage you to press on in your own life. Um, John the Baptist, whom Jesus said no one greater had arisen born among women than him, appeared to have struggled with a season of doubt. Did you know that? That John uh, had a, a period of time where he, the greatest man born among women, struggled with his doubt. Now, I know some of you, if you've been in church, maybe grown up in church, it's very interesting. Some churches treat doubt like it's n not an issue at all, like uh, y y you don't even think about it. But I've been in churches where people treated doubt like an unforgivable sin or any sign that you might struggle with believing or you might struggle with the conviction of your faith, the assurance of your faith, was almost like, well, you just need to, to get saved. You're not really a Christian if you have that. Um, I'm not encouraging you to doubt today, right? That's not the goal, is it, to try to get you to doubt. Um, but I do today want us to receive hope from the example of John the Baptist that if and when a season of doubt comes, that the Lord stands ready to strengthen you through that. To look at this, I'd like to read two passages today. The first from John chapter 1. We will have these verses on the, the screens. You can read along if you have your Bible and want to re read along there. We're going to read John 1, 29 to 34. Then we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 11 and read verses 2 to 6 because John describes in the very early ministry of John the Baptist. We go to Matthew, we're going to read something a little bit later in the life of John the Baptist. So let's start with John 1, 29 to 34. Let me remind us, this is God's Word, so listen. And it would help if I was in the right place. There we go. The next day, he, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said... Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes one who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Turning to Matthew. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. 
lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. God, please bless our reading, our hearing and understanding and doing of your word today, we pray. Amen. So as I mentioned, Jesus gave high praise to John the Baptist. None born among women have arisen that is greater than this man, John the Baptist. John the Apostle, now see, this is kind of confusing. We read in the book of John that is written not by John the Baptist, but John the Apostle, the two different people. Uh, John, the writer, the apostle, said about John the Baptist in chapter 1 that we read, John was a man sent from God. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. You hear what an important figure John the Baptist is, what an important job he had, that God sent John the Baptist to be a witness, to testify about Jesus, the light of the world, so that all might believe through him, right? So that means in a sense that every person here, if you're a Christian, you are indebted to John the Baptist, right? Because God sent him to prepare the way for Jesus so that people would believe in Jesus. So all of us, it's so fascinating to think that we owe John the Baptist because he did what God sent him to do. And that's what we read at the beginning of that passage. Now, I want us to look at what John said about Jesus in that passage we read. One of the things John did was he announced and proclaimed that Jesus is the Savior. What did he say about Jesus? He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which may be a strange description. We'll talk about that. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That that reference to Jesus being a Lamb of God points us back many, many, many centuries to the Old Testament when God rescued the Israelites out of Egypt. You might have heard of that story about Moses parting the sea and the Israelites coming out and the plagues that God sent to Pharaoh. If you remember, it was during the time that God was going to rescue the Israelites out of Egypt that the Passover happened and was instituted. God told the Israelite people that all of the families were to take a lamb They were to kill that lamb. They were to take some of the blood from the lamb. And on each of their homes, they were to wipe some of the blood on the the, the lintel, the top of the door, and the doorposts on the side. And God said that that night when he came through Egypt with the last plague, which was to kill the firstborn of every family, every man and beast, right? Pharaoh had rejected God's uh, instructions to let the Israelites go nine times, nine plagues. And the last one, the worst of all, God was going to come through and kill the firstborn. And God said, but, but every home that I see where the blood of the lamb has been smeared onto the, the doorways there, I will pass over those. And then, of course, God rescued the Israelites and brought them out of slavery and out of Egypt. So... John saw Jesus and called him the Passover lamb, the lamb of God, the one whose blood would be shed so that we could be rescued from bondage, slavery, not to Egypt, but to sin, and could be rescued and given life through Jesus Christ. His blood would take away our sins. So John proclaims Jesus right from the get-go as the Savior. John also proclaimed and announced to everyone so that they would listen to him and believe in him, his majesty, his greatness, and even in a sense, his divinity, that Jesus, who was a man, was also God. John said, after me, I said, comes a man who ranks before me. That's interesting. So in one sense, John might be saying that I'm the first one on the scene who's preaching about God sending us this Savior. But I'm not the Savior, right? The one that comes after me. I'm here to prepare the way, but I'm not the greatest. The one that comes after will be the greatest. He will be the Savior. John, in a sense, was 
saying, yes, I, I might be a prophet. Uh, I, I might have a ministry that was foretold in Isaiah 40, a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for God and the glory of God shall be revealed, right? John understood his role, who he was, that he was a prophet, that he had been foretold back long ago in the book of Isaiah. But he says, Jesus is the great one. He is Lord. I came to tell about his greatness, not my own. And his prayer, which is a prayer we shall pray, is let Jesus increase and me decrease. See, John proclaimed his greatness. And it's interesting because it, we also know that John was about six months older than Jesus. See, they were cousins. And in one sense, John is also, I think, pointing to the reality that even though John was older, that he was born first, Jesus was before he was born. He came before John. He is the eternal one, whereas John was a man just like any other whose life was temporary, who spanned a certain number of years. But Jesus, who was younger than John, actually came before him because he is eternal. So in every way, John was announcing that Jesus, the Savior, was above all others. John proclaimed Jesus also uniquely as the Messiah. Uh, that term Messiah is a word that, that the Israelites used that meant uh, that they were awaiting God's chosen deliverer, his chosen savior that would rule over them and be their king. Uh, John was preaching to prepare the people for this coming Messiah. But it is interesting. Did you know that John did not know that Jesus was the Messiah at first, right? You might be tempted to think that he always knew it was Jesus, but he didn't. And he said in this passage, I didn't know who the Messiah was going to be, but God had told me I would proclaim the way, I would prepare the way, and that I would know when I saw the Spirit descend and rest upon the one and remain upon him. See, God had spoken to John, had said, you go and I want you to baptize people with water. Tell them they need to repent, turn from their sins, turn to the Lord who's going to send them the Messiah. And when you see the one on whom the Spirit descends and remains, this is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. In other words, this is the one that will come fulfilling the promises of God's Spirit being poured out on all people who believed in him. Messiah is a word, a Hebrew word. Uh, I'm not good with Hebrew, but it would sound something like Mashiach in Hebrew. And it meant anointed or chosen. Messiah was God's chosen or anointed one. The Greek word that meant anointed later that was used was Christos. And we get from that name, of course, Christ. So if, if you didn't know, when we talk about Jesus Christ, what we are saying is Jesus the Messiah. That's what that means. It wasn't his last name. It was his title. Jesus, God's chosen or anointed. Jesus, the Messiah. So John had been told by God, the Messiah is coming. You'll know him when you see this happen. And it happened when John baptized Jesus. And John was the chosen prophet who got to tell the world that the Messiah had come. In all those things, John was saying that Jesus was Savior, that he was the greatest of all, that he was the Messiah, the promised King and Deliverer. John concluded in his testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what he called him in the passage that we read. But interestingly, having declared these revelations about Jesus before anyone else knew about them. Having these special insights, this special calling from God, having been sent to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament to prepare the way for Jesus so that all would believe in him, John still, he had some doubts. One of the interesting things about John that we may not realize is he really did not get to see very much of Jesus' ministry. John didn't firsthand get to see very much of Jesus going and healing sick people, casting out demons, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind, 
restoring the hearing of those who were deaf. He didn't get to, to see that much. It's not crystal clear in the Gospels how long of a time went from when John was proclaiming, prepare the way, Jesus is coming, until he was arrested. But by all indications, it was not very long. Not much of Jesus' ministry had happened when John was arrested. And even that period of time where maybe John was uh, still still, uh, free to go about and proclaim, there's no indication that he was going around with Jesus when Jesus began his ministry. He wasn't in the same place. He was still trying to tell people about Jesus and point people to Jesus, but they weren't ministering together. So instead of seeing the wonderful, miraculous, and mighty things that Jesus did, John ends up in jail. Um, That'll be another story for another day about why he was in jail. But John had mostly only heard about the things that Jesus did. So in that passage we read in Matthew, Jesus sent, excuse me, John sent word to Jesus by some of his disciples, some of his messengers, and he asked him a question. Are you the one who is to come? That's clearly a reference to the Messiah, the one that God had promised, the one he had been sent to prepare the way for all of these things. Are you the one, Jesus, who is to come? Or shall we look for another? Are we still waiting for the Messiah? Or are you the one? Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that John's doubts seem to have set in while he was in prison. That makes sense, doesn't it? Um, If you don't know the rest of the story about John, his situation was very serious with him being in prison, and he ended up not getting out of prison but being beheaded. Uh, Very gruesome uh, death. I wonder if John, while he was in prison, might have been praying and hoping Jesus would rescue him. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that, but it wouldn't be far-fetched. If you were in prison and your whole purpose in life was to tell people about the Savior, the Messiah, maybe you hoped, well, he might get me out of this predicament. Was John frustrated at seeing people not believing in Jesus? That might be part of it too. John may have been frustrated because even some of his own followers, John's, seemed to be at odds with Jesus. There were times they'd go to him and say, Jesus, Why are your disciples aren't fasting and we do? They they didn't seem to really understand entirely what was going on. So maybe John was frustrated seeing like even my own followers that I've told them, they're they're not believing and they're out there listening and watching. Maybe, Maybe I'm wrong about all of this. We don't really know. But we do know this, and I think we know this from experience, suffering can cause doubts or at least be fertile ground for doubts. Um, suffering will challenge and test our faith. We we just finished a study a few weeks ago of 1 Peter. And that whole book was written to people to say, don't let suffering cause you to wander away from the faith. Don't let suffering turn into doubt that turns into a rejection of the gospel. Stay strong. Your suffering is in no way evidence that God has forsaken you. You might be tempted to think that. And trust me, there is an enemy who will try to tempt you to believe that when things are going badly to say, I guess God's not really coming through. Maybe you've been wrong about all this, right? There's there's an enemy that will throw these thoughts into our minds. John was suffering. And somehow some doubts crept in. And John needed some reassurance. And I think the best lesson we get here in this story about John is that if or when doubts come, take them to the Lord. Right? This is the thing. It is not the unforgivable sin for us to have doubts. It is normal. It is sometimes necessary to come to a place of real conviction to really wrestle with your questions and your concerns. But too many times we will allow our doubts to drive us away from the Lord rather than going to Him with them in order for Him to tell us and prove us and reassure us. I have seen this in my own life. I have 
too many friends to count, and it's heartbreaking, that at one time they would have told you, yes, I'm a believer, yes, Jesus, I believe he's the Son of God, that he died for my sins, he's the Messiah, he's the Savior, that you have to believe in him to be saved, all these things. I have friends now that reject all of that. Somewhere along the way, doubt set in. And they didn't deal with those doubts and take them to the Lord. Rather, they just let them set in, let them drive them further and further away. And I have friends now that are atheists that used to be professing believers. I have friends now that practice reading tarot cards and astrology, stuff that I think takes far more faith than believing in a creator that created this magnificent world. And the the historical evidence that Jesus was indeed real and he was the son of God, right? That requires faith, but so does believing tarot cards can help you. Or that somehow the alignment of the stars have anything to do with your personal life, right? Or that there is no God and all of this is just a big cosmic accident. That, That takes some faith too. The problem is that when doubts arise, we've got a decision, are we going to let the, we're going to just follow the doubts wherever they lead or are we going to go to the one in whom we believe and tell him and say, God, I need your reassurance. God, will you confirm for me? Is Jesus indeed Lord? Is he indeed the Savior? Did he indeed die for my sins? John the Baptist sent his messengers directly to the source. They went to Jesus and they asked the very difficult, straightforward question, Are you the Messiah or are we still waiting for the Messiah to come? And Jesus sent John an answer. He said, you you go tell John what you see and what you hear, right? You make sure he knows this is real, that you're not making it up, that you've seen it with your, your own eyes, that you've heard me with your own ears. Tell John the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf have their hearing restored, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. So Jesus said, you go tell John the miracles, the signs, the wonders that I am doing and that those are ample proof that I am the one who was to come. Jesus also put his answer into words that he borrowed from the Old Testament. All of those things that he said come from the book of Isaiah that prophesied about the Messiah. So this is a very wonderful answer that Jesus gave. Not just tell him all the things I'm doing, but tell him in a way that he also understands that the prophecies of the Messiah are being fulfilled in me. Yes, I am the Messiah, just as God promised, and just as your own friends can tell you from their own eyewitness testimony. Now, I have to assume this morning that John's doubts were satisfied, that his faith, it was strengthened, that his heart received the encouragement and the reassurance he needed. And this morning, what I want to encourage us to realize is this, if doubts could come into the mind of John the Baptist, the greatest man ever born of women other than Jesus Christ, then they might be able to come upon us. But if you will take your doubts to Jesus, he will reveal to you the truth. He will reassure you. He will give you the answers that you need. One way that we can strengthen our faith and receive God's reassurance is at the Lord's Supper. So this is a good day for us to once again declare what we believe and to come to the Lord's table where God himself said, do this in remembrance of Jesus. And every time you do this until he returns, you proclaim once again his death, his resurrection. So we come today to the Lord's table to be reminded, to taste and see with our senses that Jesus is the Savior that Jesus is the Lamb of God whose blood was shed for us, that Jesus was the Son of God who came that we might have life. So we're going to come to the Lord's table in just a moment and receive once again the reassurance that God has given us. As we do, I would like to tell you that uh, we invite anyone who is a Christian to join us. Uh, You don't have to be a member of First Baptist Church. You don't have to be Baptist. Uh, We believe this is uh, the Lord's table for all Uh, who are his disciples, who've trusted in him, believed in him. So if you've made a decision, a commitment of faith and trust, 
in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to join us. If you have not, understand it. We, we, we simply want you to observe because this is something that was meant to be done by the disciples of Christ, those that believed in him. Uh, if you have not yet made a decision about your beliefs about Jesus Christ, we would encourage you just to listen, to watch, and to hear, and to ask God to show you who Jesus is as you observe and, and uh, spend this morning with us there. On that note, let us pray together as we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper. Father, I know that this morning there are many of us here today that are struggling with doubts. Lord, that is a part of faith. It is a part of life. And Lord, I thank you today that if John the Baptist could struggle with doubts, and he was the greatest born among women to ever live, that, Lord, there is plenty of hope for us. And I thank you, Lord, that you do not turn us away, that, God, you didn't turn away doubting Thomas, as we call him. But, Lord, for John, you reassured him. You told him that you were the Savior, that you were the one doing the mighty works of God, that, Lord, his faith was not misplaced but to keep on believing. Lord, I thank you that for Thomas, you said, here, Thomas, go ahead and touch and feel. Lord, I thank you that you know what it is like for us to try to walk by faith. You know what it's like when we go through seasons of great trial and difficulty, Lord, where John was imprisoned and, Lord, where we may see our lives falling apart around us, Lord, where we may pray for things that haven't come to fruition for all of our lives, Lord. Lord, thank you that you understand what we go through and that, Father, you don't turn us away, but you will give us the reassurance that we need if we will bring those doubts to you. So, Lord, as we come to the table today to be reminded and to proclaim once again that Jesus gave his life, his body to be broken, his blood to be shed for us, Father, we pray you will reassure us that this is true. Reassure us, Lord, that this is reality. Reassure us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And receive us today, Lord, both those that are strong in faith and, Lord, those that are struggling. And strengthen us all. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.